Thank you very much. And I look forward to um, all of your questions and thoughts. I'd love to really make this a bit interactive at the end. So please pop questions into the chat as we go and I can take them then or take them at the end. Um, but it would be nice to have a dialogue on, on really what we're dealing with in, in this world we live in, which has a huge climate. So um, without further ado, I have a lot of material that I've put together to give you a flavor of some of the ways that we're looking at this problem, including an overview of some of the highlights from the recent IPCC report that came out. So uh, in terms of an outline for the talk, I, there we go. Um, I'm going to start with the long term. So climate change is here. What does this mean? What does this mean for us? What does this mean for our world? What do we need to be doing in our current very urgent moment? Second, I'm going to talk about early warning systems. And this is where a lot of my research has been in terms of helping to anticipate some of the extreme events that we're seeing before they happen and to mobilize people and assets um, to get them out of the way and help protect people's livelihoods and their lives, of course, before extreme events happen. And then last is to offer a few thoughts on transformative change. Uh, this is you know, certainly inspired by what the recent IPCC report was saying about what we need to be doing in order to uh, manage this climate crisis that we're, that we're in. So, with the long term. So here, this is the title of the report that we just released. It was called Vulnerability, Adaptation, and Resilience. So there are three pieces to this IPCC report. The first piece looks at what is actually happening in our atmosphere, right? So how is climate change manifesting physically in the sky and in terms of hydrology, et cetera? Our report, the one that just came out, talks about how that is impacting humans and ecosystems around the world. And then the third report uh, that will, the third section essentially will come out in a few weeks and that will focus on how do we stop causing climate change? How do we drastically reduce emissions? We are doing this. Uh, what are some pathways forward that build resilience but also really reduce emissions and, um, and stop causing this climate crisis? So to take you through a little bit of our conclusions, um, some highlights for you here that are relevant to, to what I would like to talk about today. Um, one note is just that there were a lot of us, there were 270 authors from around the world. So we were looking across contexts and trying to boil up what could we say holistically about different regions and about the world. And there are of course documented impacts everywhere around the world. There are fewer studies in some regions. So obviously, so in, let's say parts of Africa, we have fewer studies about climate impacts. And you know, part of showing this plot is to make a plug for more research um, by authors or by researchers in those regions and, and their collaborators to help document how climate change is impacting the world. If you bring all of these impacts together, the author teams came up with what we call reasons for concern. And so here's climate change, right? So here's global average temperature going up over time. And here are five reasons for concern. Why is climate change a problem? It threatens unique and threatened systems. We see more extreme weather events. That's certainly the bulk of my work is in this category here. The distribution of impacts is not equal. We see global aggregate impacts like food systems, for example, getting impacted. And then large scale singular events like the break off of a major ice sheet becomes more possible with climate change that could be very problematic. The plot that I'm showing you here was actually produced by the last installment of this report in 2014. And here is what they said was likely to happen in 2014. So they said, here we are, we're in this sort of yellow moderate risk area here, and we expect that risks with more climate change, right? So if we make more climate change, we're really going to get up here into these very high risks and impacts across these categories. And of course, if we reduce our emissions and we don't, you know, we really reduce the climate crisis um, to, for example, 1.5 degrees, uh, which is one of the goals in the Paris Agreement, our impacts are going to be down here, still bad, but more like moderate and high. Well, 
what was very interesting, this is from 2014. So we did an update to this plot based on all the literature on impacts that we found um, around the world. And here's where we are now. So if you remember, we certainly weren't in orange before, and we are now. So some unique and threatened systems, for example, warm water coral reefs are, are you know, being irreversibly affected today. And we can't get some of that back. And of course, depending on what future we choose in terms of lowering our emissions, we're looking at a lot more purple. I don't know if you can remember with the last graph that I just showed, this was the old one and here's the new one. The new one has a lot more purple. So we realized that some of the impacts that we would be seeing at higher levels of climate change are, are a lot worse than we had thought they would be. And they're happening faster, right? The colors are happening a lot closer to today. So this is sort of the big overall risk that we're looking at in the world. And, and I think that's one of the key messages in this impacts part of the report is that it's worse than we thought and it's faster than we thought. And we have an urgent moment where we need to start thinking about adaptation. How do we adapt to living in this world that we're already living in here that's got a whole lot of red and yellow? And depending on what choices we make about uh, reducing fossil fuels and, and, and carbon emissions, the world that we're going to end up in in the future. This manifests in particular, I'd like to just take you through this extreme weather events point a little bit because this is where um, a lot of my work has been in. Um, so extremely wet events are getting wetter. So this is a projection for two degrees of climate change. How much wetter, this is the percent here, how much wetter the wettest day of the year is likely to be. And what's fascinating that you're seeing here is that almost the entire world is in blue. Um, in, almost the entire world, wettest events are going to be wetter. And then of course, it's similarly true for temperature. This is a different scale. This is actually degrees temperature. So don't compare the, don't compare the magnitude too much. Um, but extremely hot events are also getting hotter. So the hottest day of the year is likely to be several degrees hotter than it used to be in the past. And it could be even more in pretty much the entire world. So what does this mean? If that's climate change, it's already here and it's happening faster than we thought and it's possibly stronger, the impacts are larger than we thought they would be, how can we adapt? There are lots and lots of solutions and I think that, and I'm going to focus in on one particular solution. So here's a plot from, or whatever, one of the figures from the summary for policymakers of this report showing you a number of different solutions. And I made it small, I'm not expecting you to read this, but you can go and take a look. There are lots of different solutions from you know, improving cropland management and, and these can have synergistic um, effects with the sustainable development goals, right? So that's what these are all showing is that a lot of our choices can, can be positive in many ways, right? So if you're um, improving cropland management, maybe you're reducing your emissions, you're also supporting um, uh, you know, improved equality and water access and, and really um, checking off a lot of these boxes, we can create a solution space that moves us in the direction of these sustainable development pathways and um, climate resilient pathways. So one of the things on this list are early warning systems. And early warning systems was possibly the most ubiquitous adaptation mentioned across the report. It was mentioned in every single chapter as a possible adaptation option. So this included things like um, early warning systems for marine heat waves to warn fisheries um, or, or algal blooms so that we take action and prevent um, contamination of food, for example. Uh, early warning systems for floods would be super obvious. Um, early warning systems that for infrastructure. So there was an example in the North America chapter, uh, I think in the United States, about early warning systems for tracks, train tracks, that suffer in heat. And so you could do an early warning um, and prevent crashes. We knew that suffering was, was um, more likely, for example. 
So early warnings are one way that we can, we can try to avoid and reduce the impacts that we're seeing of climate change. Obviously, they're not a standalone solution. I hope that's clear. There are lots of other solutions that we need to be doing holistically, but this is one um, part of the puzzle in a lot of the place, a lot of places. And so um, we have, so I'm leading right now uh, this was called the Academic Alliance on Anticipatory Action. So we are a group of seven universities from around the world to try to help support the humanitarian sector to use early warnings of extreme events to take early action, right? So instead of waiting until after a flood to ask for flood um, humanitarian, you know, ask for money and to go help people who are dealing with the impacts of the flood. Can we do that in advance? Can we get people out of the way? Can we protect their livelihoods um, and, and really reduce some of the impacts that we're seeing? The humanitarian sector, of course, is very concerned about disasters uh, because they're already quite overstretched with the disasters that we have today. So this is one way that we've been working on anticipating disasters and, and pushing early action. So this is a little excerpt from a briefing on us. And today I'm, I'm not going to be joined by any of my colleagues uh, from the consortium, but I will be speaking a bit on their behalf about some of the work that they're all doing. So here are some pictures of, of everybody. There's seven universities, so there are quite a lot of us. It's a really fun group of researchers and I'd be happy to talk a bit more about that group um, later. So the goal of, of our work is to study extreme events and to say, can we anticipate them and what should be done before they happen? And so if you remember my earlier plots about how extreme events are happening um, more and they're happening uh, more strongly, right? More water gets dumped during a big storm, for example. Well, here's a plot of um, the scale of weather forecasts for very, very extreme rainfall events. And you can see that in most places, again, we do have some blue where weather forecasts, this is a, um, probability of detection of these events. I just labeled the, the graphs. Um, so in most places, we can detect events and, and warn people this is actually at a three-day lead time before that event happens in their location. So there's quite a lot of skill in our weather models. You must use them in your everyday life. And so the question is, can we use these weather models to really scale up early action before disasters? And obviously for heat, actually the um, drought is even more dramatic. We have very good skill in anticipating extreme heat and heat waves before they happen uh, all over the world. So what does this mean for us? If we can start to anticipate how these weather events will impact our food system, for example. So they might impact the production of food um, and that might have ripple effects down to, you know, around the world, or they might affect the transport of food and markets, right? So we saw in British Columbia last year, some massive flooding, totally unprecedented flooding near Vancouver. And that completely disrupted the transport and sale of milk um, from dairy farms. And this was a big problem. And there were, I mean, a lot of the farms in that region um, suffered heavily from these floods. So the question is, can we anticipate some of these impacts? Can we make our food system more resilient? And can we also, um, based on a short warning, help avoid some of the impacts that we that we might otherwise see? So here comes this terminology of early warning or early action. This is how the humanitarian sector talks about using forecasts. Because it's not enough to get a forecast, we actually also take action based on that forecast. So this is the cover of the World Disasters Report in 2009, uh, I believe which was really pushing this idea of early warning, or early action. But what we find is that often early warnings happen, but there is very little early action. I mean, maybe people, you know, get a weather forecast and they bring an umbrella somewhere, but, but at the scale that we need to really get people out of the way and protect our assets, there's a lot more that could be done. In, in the use of these early warning systems to deal with uh, climate extremes. So one of the things that I've been working on for many years is how to make early action more of a default. Can you make it someone's responsibility to take action when they have the early warning? 
and make sure that they do have funding available to take that action appropriate to the moment. So here are some examples that prompted some of these investments. So in Pakistan in 2010, there were major floods that caused um, many deaths and also a lot of displacement. In Somalia in 2011, there was a very drought that caused a famine, which totally shocked the world. It was shocking that they could have something like this happen. Um, I would say that we are in the middle of um, a number of failed rainy seasons in Somalia at the moment, and there's a lot of concern about making sure we have enough early action right now to prevent something like that from happening again. So based on some of these failures in the past, we said, how can we make early action possible? In both of these cases that I'm showing you, there were forecasts, right? There were lots of early warnings. And so we invented something called forecast-based financing. And we said, okay, based on the forecast of the extreme event, we're going to trigger the um, dispersal of humanitarian finance. And we're going to have a set of rules, rules and roles and responsibilities to say, these people are responsible for taking action in these places if we anticipate floods in the future, for example. So this is what we've been um, designing in the humanitarian sector, and this has paid off um, quite dramatically with a lot more investment in anticipating action across the humanitarian sector. And of course, I would say a uh, long ways to go. So there is a new fund for example, in um, this is for the Cross Red Crescent movement, but there are others in the UN, for example, there are SERP with the same kind of comment. Erin, Erin, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. It seems yeah. like we're having some problems. Your microphone is kind of cutting in and out. I don't know if oh, there's no. something you can do on your end. Uh, so it's a little smoother. Uh, great question. I don't, I haven't done anything. Um, how, how are you hearing me now? Do you, was it better if you I move a little bit closer to the microphone? I mean, now it's fine. Thank you. It's fine? Okay, how's this? You know what it could be? Maybe sometimes if I turn my head, uh, the noise cancellation cuts out my voice. So I'm going to try to look dir directly at you and talk, but please just cut right back in again if, if it happens again. Thanks. Okay, um, so in terms of scaling up this idea of early action, the humanitarian sector and others have formed a risk-informed early action partnership. So one of the targets, for example, is that 1 billion more people are covered by new or improved early warning systems. So this is a dramatic goal that we're working on for the next few years to really rise to the occasion here of more disasters, more extreme events, um, and potentially higher need. So how are we going to do this? Definitely lots more of these early action protocols, these triggers, more commitments. So we're pushing different um, groups to make sure that they make commitments so that we can scale up these early action programs and make sure that there is funding available to evacuate people um, and that there is you know, support for early harvesting and things like this before a potential disaster happens. And so what happens on the ground? Does this work? That's our next big frontier is to make sure that, of course, the concept of early warning, early action is obvious. We know that evacuating people can save lives, but can we scale this up in a way that it, it actually really does benefit people um, and, and improves our resilience? So I'm going to show a few examples of evaluations that have been done in the past using Bangladesh as an example, and then talk about a few that this um, 4 A's consortium, this Academic Alliance for Anticipatory Action, is working on currently. So in Bangladesh, um, heavy flooding is a, is a big problem. And so a few years ago, there was a forecast of extreme flooding along the um, Brahmaputra River in the northern part of Bangladesh. And so there was a cash distribution given to people who were uh, likely to be flooded in the coming days, knowing that these people were likely to have to move. And the cash was to enable them to move more of their assets out of the way and purchase um, healthy food while they were temporarily displaced. So this was the, the goal of this mechanism. And so we did find, so here's an example of a study that was done afterwards, that people um, did eat healthier food when they were given that cash transfer pre-flood uh, so that wherever they ended up 
being displaced to, they were able to eat healthier food. So we saw much fewer reports of having to eat only rice um, for a whole day, for example. Um, in 2020, there was another cast in Bangladesh at this time. So that first one was actually Bangladesh Red Crescent, this intervention. And this one was done by the World Food Program. Um, where they supported people with cash, again, along the Jamuna River in the northern part of Bangladesh. They reached about 30,000 families and they found, again, um, significant, significant impacts in terms of food consumption, both in children and adults, you know, impacts in terms of satisfaction, um, reduced asset loss, et cetera, et cetera. So, we do have some preliminary results that cash was probably an appropriate strategy in this particular location. And um, so scaling up this kind of anticipatory action and this anticipatory support in other places where people could be affected by similar disasters could be useful. Of course, cash might not be the appropriate response in different places. And so again, coming back to that group I mentioned at the beginning, we are studying uh, some anticipatory action triggers that have happened around the world to understand were they appropriate in their context, how much did people benefit, and to what extent could we um, could we improve that in the future. So I'll give you a highlight of a couple of things that we're working on right now. So first I mentioned um, that Somalia and Ethiopia are in the middle of a large drought, and this is a multi-year, multi-season drought, and so OCHA had actually um, invested 10, more than $10 million in Somalia and something similar in Ethiopia in 2011 in anticipation of these failed rainy seasons. And so this included support um, via cash transfers in some places, but it also included specific livelihood inputs. So specific inputs for farming and specific inputs for pastoralists, for example, to help them hopefully protect their assets and get through a failed rainy season. And you can see here, this is, um, I took from their, one of their documents, this is some of their theory of change, what they are hoping to um, achieve with this anticipatory action. So right now we're doing the, uh, some interviews with people who, or, or some surveys of people who received this support and people who didn't receive the support to try to understand uh, was this the right support? And is this the right thing? Was it early enough? How did it help? Would we need to do something different next time, for example? Um, one of our big questions here is this question of, of protracted crises. So if you support people to feed their animals for a period of time during a drought, but then the drought continues for another year or so, uh, those animals might die anyway. So was this the appropriate intervention? Was it the appropriate length of intervention? Uh, were there other things that could have been done that might have been more supportive of people dealing with this really immense crisis? Uh, these are all questions that we're tackling right now in Somalia and Ethiopia. Uh, the next example I have for you is in Mali and Senegal. So this, was a, this is a new, um, there are lots of these new disaster risk finance mechanisms that pay out based on anticipated disaster. So this is a new way of, of providing support pre-disaster. So the World Food Program purchased a replica product of a sovereign insurance program called ARC, the Africa Risk Capacity. And so they received a 7.1 million payout based on a forecast of how crop yields were going to be. And based on that, they projected forward how that might affect food security in the region. And they said, okay, we are projecting that in the future, food security is going to drop substantially in this, in this area. So we are going to support people now, um, instead of waiting for hungry people, you know, to then start helping out. So they're doing some very interesting interventions. This is specifically about Mali. They're doing um, nutrition support for particularly vulnerable people, but they're also investing cash in communities um, to help people build productive assets that might help them in the future. For example, building a dam. Um, and so they're paying people to design a community project and implement it 
as part of this anticipatory action program, which is, I think, very interesting. And we'll get to evaluate and see, uh, see how that's working. Uh, Senegal is something similar. It's not World Food Program. It's the START Network, which is a network of NGOs. Uh, the drought was somewhat different there, but they're doing a very similar type of support in anticipation of the food insecurity that they are um, expecting in Senegal. So this is ongoing at the moment. And then last, you might have heard recently about some flooding in Mozambique. Um, they have been hit by some tropical storm cyclone type, um, two, two different uh, tropical storm and cyclone like phenomenon. And these have dumped a huge amount of water in a particular region of Mozambique, and that's caused some flooding. And in anticipation of that, so because people could see this, the storm bearing down on the country and they could you know, put the rain through a flood model, they could get an idea of who is likely to flood. And so this is um, a document about how the Red Cross Red Crescent movement invested about $250,000 to support Mozambique Red Cross to take early action. So this is another example of something that our team is, um, is, is evaluating. Did this work? How did the early action go? What could be done differently or better next time? Um, and and you know, to what extent can we improve these anticipatory actions systems? So that was my section on early warning systems and our consortium. Whoops. And I'd love to just uh, the last few minutes to talk a bit about the big picture. So here we are. Climate change is here. We have a lot of urgent decisions to make about a climate resilient, low carbon future. One way of building resilience is using early warning systems, right? Getting a heads up before these extreme events hit us. And I would argue that we need more investment in early warning systems to make sure that, that we're not um, being surprised by some of these horrific events that are coming our way. The last question that I'd love to pose to all of you, and this can be a bit more of a discussion, I'd love to hear your thoughts, is on this question of transformative change. How can we think big in society and think big when it comes to early warning systems about making bigger changes to make our society more resilient and more, um, of course, also low carbon? So. When it comes to early warning systems, I would say that this IPCC report posed some tough questions, right? You know, early warning systems can be useful, right? You can evacuate people, move them out of the way, the storm passes, and then you let people go right back where they were, and you rebuild their houses exactly as they were before. And then you have a society that has the exact same vulnerability as before the storm. How can we ask ourselves maybe some more difficult and challenging questions about what needs to change in the long term to improve our resilience um, instead of just building back exactly as we were? Can we build back better? And can we, um, can early warning systems as an adaptation strategy be part of that process of building back better? And a second point for discussion here would be unprecedented extremes. We are starting to see extreme events that you didn't actually believe were possible. <laughs> and now with climate change, we are seeing them happen and we now realize that they are possible. Um, for example, the heat wave in the Pacific Northwest last year, I think a lot of people didn't, you know, including many climate people, didn't realize that that was even physically possible for, for it to get so hot in that region. And so, if we're designing early warning systems and we're designing bigger adaptation projects, how can we make sure that we're considering these unprecedented events and that we're not just um, building early warnings for things that have happened in the past, but recognizing what is now possible today and what could happen uh, tomorrow in our current and, and changed climate. So to give you an idea of where we are in this world, we did this um, global adaptation mapping initiative where we screened um, and coded thousands of papers on adaptation to climate change around the world. And um, there were about 48,000 papers that we dealt with and we coded them all, et cetera, trying to show, trying to, to look for what, 
was the actual evidence that people are adapting to climate change. And well, of course, there was lots of evidence that people are adapting, like early warning systems, people are building more resilient infrastructure, all of these things. Most of that evidence was about um, changes and adaptations that were very incremental. And so here was our plot of evidence of transformational adaptation. And you can see that pretty much for every region, we're looking at low evidence for transformational adaptation with you know, a few exceptions that brought us maybe over the threshold to what we would call medium. Um, so in most places, this means that maybe we are you know, planting our crops a few days earlier, but we're not thinking critically about what kind of crops are we planting? Should we even be planting those crops in this region, et cetera, et cetera? What, is, what might need to transform for us to build this climate resilient and sustainable development future? Um, so our answer is so far, this is not, not enough. We're not doing enough on this topic. And um, this would be something that we need to push a bit more in the future. And I think early warning systems, of course, can fall into this trap, but like based on what I was saying earlier about them putting people back in harm's way without talking about transformation. We also found, oh, sorry for the resolution on this one. We also found that people who were living in conflict affected areas um, were, there was very little evidence of people talking about climate change and climate risk in these places. And this can be problematic because if you get storm in Yemen, um, these people who are living in conflict affected areas often have few, uh, very little access to social services. Maybe they're not able to move as they would normally be able to move. Um, and so they become very, very vulnerable to climate, uh, climate shocks. And we found that most of the papers that we could find, you know, there were very few papers across most of the countries that we looked at. Um, most of the papers talked a bit about, you know, farming and the impacts on farming, but we didn't see, you know, a lot of, of, of work on health, for example, in these very, very vulnerable contexts. So this is another sort of big red flag in terms of our blind spots, um, you know, and, and how do we make sure that if a massive heat wave impacts a region that has a lot of refugees, are they just, they're, um, they're very vulnerable to heat for example. So this is another uh, big red flag gap. And then another one that we found when we did this adaptation review was that equity was not fundamentally um, or systematically considered across adaptation options. And this is going to be an, an adaptation uh, projects. So this is going to be a key one in terms of future thinking on and, and, and success in adapting to climate change is considering equity and justice. Who is being left behind? And uh, to keep with the early the examples from early warning systems, we saw this uh, here as well, that for example, early warning systems would be developed in a region without recognizing that um, some of the most vulnerable people and the lowest income people didn't have cell phones to receive the alert message, for example. So these are things that we need to be very cognizant of if we're actually going to be successful at reducing the impacts of climate change. So I wanted to share with you the preliminary results to help people talk about this. So this is another line of research that I'm working on with the Red Cross Red Crescent. It is, um, and actually, some of the, the methodological information here. But can we look at these unseen extreme events and help people imagine how might those events play out and what kind of contingency planning and preparation do we need to do now to prepare for these potentially new events that um, are now possible in our changed climate. So uh, one example is that we were doing, this is a small example, we were doing You can see here in blue are actual total rainfall amounts for the month of June over time. But in black and, and gray are box plots where we re-ran that year in a climate model and said, well, look, 
run the year 2000 hundreds of times and say, well, what are all sorts of other possible ways that 2000 could have panned out in Nemaha, Kansas? And here are all the different ways that we got. So essentially, we have an expert blue. This is people's experience of the world. And then here in gray, we have examples of alternative realities. These are things that could have happened, but didn't, but maybe someday might happen. The goal here is to use is to think of what happens if it to the kilometers or 300 kilometers of rainfall in June in Kansas. How might that impact people? And can we start to build out these scenarios, working with, of course, the Red Cross Red Crescent Movement, other disaster managers, um, and build out storylines to help people say, what would happen in this case? Who is very vulnerable? How might this interest people? What kind of advance notice would we need to prepare for it? Um, what kind of adaptation do we need now to um, prepare for these potential unforeseen and never before experienced events? This is a whole new line of research where essentially we're pushing imagination and saying, can we help people imagine what this could look like? And even though we've never experienced it before, put in place adaptations, so early warnings, but also other adaptations, resilient infrastructure, um, insurance policies, whatever it is, so that we are more resilient and less affected as, as climate change is, is here with us today and, and continues to get worse. So I'd love to stop here and take some time for, so I'll stop sharing with you. I hope the audio was better. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, no problem. So let me see. I would like to start, here we go, uh, with a question as people wrap up their thoughts. And I was thinking as I was listening you talk, how complex this is and how important it is to really invest in, in resiliency and to try to minimize those long-term impacts. Um, so, but just focusing back on these uh, maybe necessary uh, immediate responses to these disasters, I was hoping that you could talk a little bit more about the process and about how to prioritize. So how do you decide, I mean, how to allocate, what to allocate to what kind of projects, what kind of uh, people, families, businesses, um, how do you actually get it to them? And, and, and how do you put a, a price on that? And how long do you support them for to, to, to be able to survive this uh, short-term impact? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So, I think there's no right answer to that. I think there are some ways that we could approach that problem. We are having problems with your oh, no. sound again. I'm I sorry. Say, I've never had this problem before, so I'm not actually sure how to fix it. If I move a little bit closer, is that better? Maybe. With audio settings. Yeah, I don't know. It seems to come and go. Uh, right yeah, now you're fine. Very bizarre. Okay, I'm just going to speak very close to the computer because, as I mentioned, I've not had this problem before. Um, and uh, suppressed background noise auto. Well, I don't know how to fix it. Um, okay, right. So there are a number of different ways that we can approach the, um, the question that you asked. One way is to say, um, yeah, Zoom is trying to mute background noise. So what's funny is there is no way to turn it off. There's only low, medium, high, or auto. So I'll put it on low, see if this makes it better. Is that better? No. Well, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure. Also, there's not really any background noise in, in everyone, right? So I'm not sure what is going on. So maybe um, try try to speak a little louder and okay. slower so we yes. we catch more words. Very strange. I hear you well. 
so I don't know what it is. So what there are some people who have been working on cost benefit analysis to try to determine what is the appropriate early action, the appropriate amount of money and for what kind of um, outcome that we're looking for. That is fraught with problems because, you know, costing a human life, um, costing some, some non-tangible outcomes is very, very difficult. So that's one approach. Um, another approach is, is, you know, much more consultative um, to talk with people about, well, what are the options and can we come up with really good investment options that are so important that the costs and benefits are pretty clear to everybody involved. Um, you know, I would say that if we are willing to spend millions of dollars post-disaster on relief, you know, there's, it's, it's, you can have a conversation about spending several hundred thousand pre-disaster on preventing the loss of lives or infrastructure, for sure. Um, and for infrastructure, it can be easier to actually do the costing. So if you're going to pay for sandbags and labor, to stand back a river, sometimes cost out the lack of damage to infrastructure, for example. Um, but it's not easy, and it's often a very consultative process. So, maybe can you elaborate a bit on that? So, what is the role of the community, the impacted communities, in deciding where the help goes? Yeah, um, it depends on the implementing organization. So yeah, it really depends. So for example, this World Food Program uh, program that I mentioned works with the impacted communities to determine what kind of projects they're going to build. But the World Food Program itself would select the communities, for example. Um, in some other cases, community leaders are selecting who might be the recipients of what kind of support. Uh, so it really, it really varies. Um, and, and usually, I mean, so some of the studies that we're trying to do with the um, Anticipatory Action Consortium is to understand from the point of view of, of affected people, what would they have preferred? How did they do? What might have been more supportive? Um, or, 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 yeah, what, what does that whole world look like for them? Thank you. So I'll move on to the, the questions in the Q&A now. Uh, the first one uh, asks, how has weather forecasting accuracy changed over the past 20 years? Um, if you have them, can you mention percentage numbers of correct versus incorrect? Yeah, um, let me just see if I can pull up a plot for you. Um, there is a pretty iconic plot that um yeah here's here's a pretty iconic plot from noah showing um okay well this isn't even the one i was looking for but anyway here i'm just going to show you this plot because, so i don't uh take more of your time this is the kind of thing you can see um these different colors tell you how far in advance we can forecast something so yellow is 10 days in advance and blue is three days in advance and so here's time so here's how good our forecasts were in the 80s and here's how good they were a few years ago um, and you can see and this is actually looking at um not looking at rainfall or temperature it's looking at um, higher atmosphere behavior but um Anyway, to give you an idea of, of most of the plots look like this, if you see our, our improvement in, in weather forecasting over time. So it's been quite dramatic. Um, and there's a nice article about just how this is, has been a very quiet revolution. I mean, this has revolutionized our world over, you know, what, 20, 30 years um, and, and just what that means. Sarah, I'm not hearing you. Is that? Sorry, I was okay. muted. Now it's my turn. Um, so apart from early warning systems, 
uh, what are some uh, of the other adaptation strategies that could be transformational? Um, yeah, great question. So relocation is talked about often. So choosing where we live, uh, that can be, you know, that can be simple or complex. We are seeing rapid urbanization all around the world. So choosing how cities build as people move into cities and where the city expands to, for example, is a really important one um, that can be very transformational. Um, healthcare systems is another big one. So how, you know, how much people can access healthcare and how easy that is and how good that is can really transform, you know, in terms of the health burden of climate change, that could be a really big one. Um, trying to think of some others. Different types of cooperation can really break down, um, yeah, you know, in, in intergovernmental cooperation or whatever can break down former barriers and really transform systems and transform, you know, how we work together and, and, and what kind of livelihoods we have and, and things like that. So livelihood diversification is, of course, uh, another big example of transformation. Thank you. Um, I have another question here. Uh, let me read. Many people in high income countries have proven highly capable of ignoring forecasts from scientists. Does your expertise give you any insight into what types of concrete events around the world may be impossible to ignore? What future events likely will knock global climate policy out of its complacency? Yeah, let me see if I can read it. Um, yeah, great, great question. So I think we are seeing, so the science of event attribution has increased dramatically over time. So our ability to talk about a specific really devastating event in the context of climate change, didn't we didn't used to be able to do that because it requires anyway, complex methods and really intense climate modeling, but we can do that now. And so, uh, that heat wave I mentioned in the Pacific Northwest, the fact that that was all over the newspapers saying that this was essentially impossible in a world without climate change and these deaths were, you know, because of this event, uh, I think that has been important. And little by little, I mean, the big floods we saw in Germany, for example, there was also an attribution study that came out um, for that event saying that it was again made more, that kind of event is more frequent in a world with climate change. So, I do think that experiencing extreme events is a huge motivator for global climate policy. Uh, and so I think more events, I mean, you know, Hurricane Harvey, for example, was another one that had an attribution study showing that the, the effects of Hurricane Harvey were worse because of climate change. So it's sad to say, but I think a lot of these events have been wake up calls for the global community also because it makes you realize that this isn't about someone else, right? This is about me and, and you and wherever we live, these things can happen to us. Do I have a prediction of which event might be a tipping point for global climate? I don't know. Um, I think really big hurricanes and cyclones um, tend to be very memorable. So that could be a big one. So some of these really, you know, these flood events, because you can see the devastation like in pictures, um, I think that they tend to be the most motivational compared to heat waves where you really don't, even though more people die from heat waves, you don't, it's not, you don't get the news media in the same way. Um, and droughts are so complex and there are so many factors that influence droughts. So they tend to get sort of more messy to communicate with us. So I would put my money on major flood events being really big pushers of action. Okay. Uh, hi, Erin. Um, this is Alexandra from hey. um, Was I When I was watching your presentation this time, I found myself thinking a lot about the big picture shape of the climate change problem where we've got you know, the wealthier countries are driving the change, the most vulnerable countries are the most strongly affected, um, and then the wealthy countries are also in the position of being able to allocate resources and having a lot of power in how to manage these issues. Um, and so 
I was, I mean, I, I'm interested in hearing more about how these projects interact with sovereignty. I heard you mention some work on funding community resilience projects, and I'm just interested in hearing a bit more about that facet of uh, what you and these various organizations have been trying to do. Thank you. Yeah. Inequality was a big theme of the report we just wrote, and I did an op-ed for the Boston Globe actually about that um, a week or two ago. So basically, I mean, as long as we have a world with such large inequality, we will see losses and damages from climate change, and we will not see the, the climate resilient future that we're looking for. It's just, it's incompatible because people who are very vulnerable get affected by it doesn't mean that the rest of us are immune. I, I want to be careful of that argument that climate change is a problem for other people in other places. It's not. It's a problem for all of us, for sure. And so we need to simultaneously recognize these, you know, unprecedented extremes that could happen in Boston, for example, while working very hard on this issue of, of different vulnerabilities around the world, inequality and how that manifests and how that makes many people very vulnerable um, and, and putting in adaptations that support people. We talked a lot about social safety nets and social safety nets can be used. There's a lot of work now to try to help make them anticipatory, um, to anticipate needs before they happen, to make sure they reach everyone who is likely to be impacted by climate change, for example. So these are, these are certainly things to, to try not to leave people behind because we're not supposed to move forward if we have if we're leaving behind. Thank you. Uh, I think Alex has a question. Hey Erin, thank you. Thank you for a great talk. I, I learned a lot and you're doing such important work. Um, I guess following up on um, questions of inequality, I guess I had a question about inequality, but also power. Um, you know, it seems to me a lot of what you're doing is, is scenario planning, right? Or trying to develop how we think about scenarios and 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 how we how we plan for them, especially in contexts of like unprecedented events. Which um, I, I don't know much of the the history of scenario planning, but some things I've 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 read about and and looked about looked at um, fairly critically, having to do with like biosecurity um, 10, 15 years ago and the emergence of of new infectious diseases. Um, what seemed clear was that um, how people forecasted these events um, had a, a reflection of what institutions they were coming from, what, what their interests were. If the Department of Defense in the United States is talking about the reemergence of the 1918 Spanish flu, its scenarios and its solutions were oftentimes quite different than, um, um, say, a, a, another institution. So in your own scenario building work, I'm, I'm just curious about how you think about um, trying to ensure neutrality or trying to ensure um, um, balanced institutional perspectives or something something to that effect? It's a great question. And um, one thing I would mention is that, you know, people take advantage of these events. I mean, so, you know, if someone forecasts uh, La Nina in Kenya, a lot of people will hoard food and then rise the raise the prices just you know and, and they profit from so anyway so there are all sorts of questions about how to do scenario planning well a lot of my work is with humanitarian agencies that take a very explicit stance of neutrality uh, so i have found that helpful um and you know and frankly i i'm not sure i have a good answer to what you're saying. I mean, we need to essentially make sure that someone's response to climate change doesn't hurt other people, which it absolutely can. There was a lot of work we did in this um, IPCC report about maladaptation. So people who are trying to adapt to our changed climate and end up essentially causing negative impacts on other people, either via increasing emissions or, um, or for example, you can build a nice flood seawall around your city, and then that causes the sediment to wash down and hurt another location. So 
Um, there are some techniques to try to avoid maladaptation, and that usually involves getting more stakeholders at the table and making sure that diverse stakeholders have a voice of power, like what you were saying, or voice of, how do you say it, our own voices of authority. Um, and but doing that is very difficult. But I think that was probably the best evidence we found of how people have tried to avoid maladaptation in, in practice. Thank you very much. We're going to leave it at that because it's one o'clock. But thank you, Erin, so much for a really wonderful talk. And we still have a few questions, so I, I will encourage people to reach out to you if they want to continue the conversation, if that's okay. And with that, thank you, Erin, one more time. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And I look forward to being in touch. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.